right. Well, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, to the third event in our Australia's Amazing Island series. So this series is brought to you by Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and the Roots and Shoots Australia Resource Box for Schools program. Roots and Shoots Australia is an initiative of the Jane Goodall Institute Australia. Roots and Shoots Australia helps mentor and empower young people to help make a difference for animals, people, and our environment. So do take some time to visit the website. Here we are, rootsandshoots.org.au, uh, and to sign up. And then, of course, there's a great community here you can find on Facebook uh, to keep up with all the latest updates and news. Find your local group. So a couple links there for you to check out. So uh, this is, as I just mentioned, our third lesson in the Australia's Amazing Island series. And it's going to be a little bit different today. I've been hosting all the sessions, but I'm also going to be the speaker tonight because I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, the island we're going to focus on today several times. So I'm going to share some pictures, some of my experiences, and some of what makes this island so unique uh, and so special. So I see people are already starting to say hi in the chat, which is great. We've got groups in Sydney, New South Wales, in Perth, uh, in Victoria. Looks like another group in Perth. Gold Coast as well. So keep those greetings coming in and we will get things started uh, for tonight. So a little bit about myself. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'm coming to you live from uh, Ontario, Canada in a little village called Alora, which is about an hour outside of Toronto. So I'm the founder of a non-for-profit called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And so this organization, we aim to inspire the next generation of scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists and we do that um, by beaming live events, live connections with guest speakers, virtual field trips uh, into classrooms across North America and around the world. So if you do want to dig a little bit deeper, you can visit exploringbytheseat.com. You can find all the events that we have coming up. All of our events record live to YouTube as well. So if it's not time zone friendly where you are in the world, you can check out the recordings. And we're hoping to start doing more events uh, in the part of the world where you'll find Australia and Indonesia, India, and other countries as well. So we'll be doing more events geared towards that area of the world. So a little bit more about myself. I'm an explorer with the National Geographic Society, uh, and I love scuba diving. In fact, I lived in Australia in Wollongong for a year uh, while my future wife went to teacher's college, and I bartended and traveled all across uh, Australia. And uh, I've been diving ever since. I started diving in 2007. Uh, and I'm always training to get new certifications uh, to dive in new places and try new things under the water. So we're going to get into tonight's island. I'm really excited for tonight's island. Formerly known as Fraser Island, now returned to its Aboriginal name of Gari. Uh, a little bit about the island's history to start before I share my screen. So uh, the Bachilla people. Uh, are the traditional owners of Gari. And so for more than 5,000 years, but it's possible that it's as long as 50,000 years. So the Bachelor people have lived in harmony with the seasons and the land and sea, maintaining a balance between spiritual, social, and family connections. So the original name Gari is the Aboriginal word meaning paradise. So after we dive in and learn a little bit more about this island, I think you will agree that it is the perfect name uh, for this island. And I do apologize if I slip and call it Fraser Island a few times. Um, like I said, I did visit it a few years ago and at the time it was still Fraser Island before returning to uh, the traditional name of Gari. So I'm gonna share my screen here uh, and we are going to get started. Just bear with me for a moment. And you should see a map coming up to get things started. Okay, perfect. I think that's there, nice and front and center. So I think the best thing to do is to kind of situate ourselves a little bit if you're unsure of Gary's location. So we kind of have this bigger, and let me zoom in a little bit here to the kind of the bigger view of Australia. You can see we've got Queensland here, and then you have Brisbane. And if you look to the north, uh, you find the location here. And so if we pull out a little bit more, you can kind of get a little bit of a view. Oops, there we go. No, nope, it's not working. Use the arrows. There we go. So you can get a nice view here uh, of Gari. And you can see some of the areas along the coast that we're going to talk about here labeled, like the Pinnacles, the Mahino Rack, Eli Creek, Lake Mackenzie, 
uh, a few other places like that. Okay, let's continue through. I've got a closer view here. I want to zoom in a little bit closer here. Uh, but before I do, I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Gari. So it is the world's largest sand island. So it um, was created over hundreds of thousands of years from sand drifting off the east coast of the mainland Australia. And it collected there because of three rocks. And in this next map I'm going to show you, you're going to see these three rocks. These three rocks are called Wadi Point, Middle Point, and Indian Head. And so these rocks acted as anchors and that allowed the sand to gather around their bases. And over thousands of years, the sand continued to build up, uh, forming this incredible, amazing, large island. So let's take a little look at this next slide. I have to zoom out here. There we go. Okay, so you can see a nice little closer look. And actually, these rocks aren't very big. You see the one here, Wadi Point, you see Middle Rocks, and you see Indian Head. And it's because of these formations that anchored the sand, forming this massive sand island uh, over thousands of years. So that kind of gives you a, a little geological look at these three points here, these three large rocks, uh, and how they played a huge role in the formation of the world's largest uh, sand island. So originally it was part of the mainland until about 20,000 years ago, uh, during the last ice age, the sea levels rose and then it was separate, uh, separated from that mainland Australia. Gari stretches for 123 kilometers and is about 22 kilometers wide. And it's a UNESCO World Heritage listed site for many reasons. Um, not only is it the world's largest sand island, it's the only place on earth where tall rainforests grow on sand dunes. It's also home to half of the world's perched lakes. So these are really unique lakes that are formed in depressions in sand dunes, and they're filled permanently with rainwater. We're going to learn a little bit more about those. I have some images that I want to share with you. And these sand dunes uh, on Fraser Island are massive. They can be taller than Sydney Opera House. They're some of the largest sand dunes uh, in the world, and they've helped protect um, Gari in a way that allows the rainforest to thrive. We're gonna learn a little bit more about that as we go a little bit deeper uh, into our lesson today. So let's roll on to some images because what I thought was so amazing the first time I visited Gari is that there are no roads. It's a complete sand island. So if you want to be able to get around on the island, you need a four by four like this. And uh, I was able to visit the island twice uh, and had to use one of these four by fours to get around. So all the roads are basically sand tracks. You're either driving on sand tracks uh, or you're driving along what's called the sand highway uh, along the 75 mile beach uh, to kind of get to different parts of the island and you can kind of dive into the sand tracks to visit spots uh, in the interior of the island. So you need one of these four by fours uh, to get around on uh, Gari. So I'm going to go through a few more images here. So to get there from the mainland, you drive onto a ferry. And so I've got an image here and you can see down below uh, some of my friends here who are packing the four by four, making sure we're ready to get off uh, onto the island. And depending on when you get onto this ferry, sometimes it's quiet like it was on this day, or sometimes it's uh, a lot busier like this day where there's multiple four by fours. There's also vehicles uh, delivering fresh supplies um, to the island as well. So some days can be busier than others when you come across. And once you hit there, um, you kind of see this sign welcoming you. Again, still referring to as Fraser Island because this was from several years ago. Uh, as a world heritage site and the traditional home of the Batula people. So uh, let's take a look at these roads. So here we go. This is what would be considered a good road, I think, uh, on Gari. So you can see it's quite bumpy. You can see it goes up and down. Uh, and you can see why that 4x4 is so important to make your way through uh, the island and travel from place to place. And then this is that, that highway I told you about. It's a very unique highway. It's a sand highway. 
at different parts of the day, depending on where you are, it's inaccessible due to the, the high tide. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that in just a moment, but you can see all the tracks from the vehicles making their way along the beach, it stretches for at least 75 miles, uh, and is the easiest way to kind of get from you know one end to the other end of the island. And then you can dip in at different parts to check out different features and different, um, I guess, attractions, natural features of the island. Now, not only is it a highway, but it's also uh, a runway. So another way to get to Gari is, of course, by plane from the mainland. And so sometimes you're driving along the beach and planes are landing as well. And sometimes uh, vehicles, if you look to the right, as large as buses, um, kind of big uh, four by four buses are used sometimes on the island as well. So you can see not only is it a highway, it's also uh, a landing strip. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the sand and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the lakes. And I do want to mention that the sand is pretty amazing. The sand on Gari is white silica uh, in a lot of places. And the sand is uh, really amazing, pure sand. And, you know, it's said that the sand uh, is purer than the sand found in the Sahara Desert, which I think is another pretty amazing fact um, that the sand is so, the silica, the sand is so pure. You know, you think of deserts, you think of the Sahara, uh, but the sand found on Gari is actually pure. So I want to dive into some of these lakes here, these perch lakes I told you about. And what makes them so unique uh, is that they are filled with rainwater and they don't connect uh, to streams uh, or connect directly with the ocean. So this lake here is called Lake Mackenzie. And you can see kind of walking down this boardwalk towards Lake Mackenzie. It's probably one of the most visited sites uh, on the island. And being a perch lake, it contains only rainwater, doesn't connect or flow to the ocean. And at the bottom, sand and organic matter, so um, leaves and things like that, form a layer. And that layer at the bottom blocks water from draining away. It's impervious to water, uh, which is kind of cool. Around Lake Mackenzie, the sand is pure white silica, and that acts as a filter, which makes the water incredibly pure and the water is also very acidic so that combination of being really pure and really acidic means that not very much life can live in fraser island or sorry not in fraser island in lake mackenzie and so let's take a couple more looks here you can see just how clear that water is it looks almost like a pool uh, in some parts and there's a little bit of life so i was free diving i was doing some snorkeling and when I went down about 15, 20 feet, you could see all kind of the leaf muddy bottom uh, and all of these freshwater turtles sitting in the bottom. So um, I took a look at this one that was swimming past. I've got a little closer look here so you can take kind of a closer look at this freshwater turtle. Nice big uh, hands and feet for moving through the water. Nice big eye as well. Uh, and then of course, just let the turtle continue on and swim uh, along its way. So not a lot of life, but there were tons uh, of these freshwater turtles, especially along the bottom of Lake Mackenzie. And so another important thing on Gari is they're really trying to protect the area, especially areas where people visit a lot. So there's a lot of spots where you see these fences or these signs that say rehabilitation area. So, you know, no access. So you can see here our Frisbee drifted in there. And I'm using a stick to try and get it out so I don't have to step uh, on any of the plants that are, are kind of coming back uh, into this area, in this rehabilitation area. We're going to talk a little bit more about conservation. We'll talk about the dingoes and we're going to talk a little bit more about invasive species uh, on the island as well. Now, I mentioned the rainforest. The rainforest is... Uh, absolutely incredible. And what makes it so unique is normally when you think of sand, you don't think of nutrients. So it's kind of surprising to, to know that there's a big, healthy rainforest growing on Gari. And so plants grow in these dunes, grow in this sand, and they get their nutrients from two sources, from rain and from the sand itself. So 
they are situated kind of in the middle of the dunes. So the dunes kind of protect on either side and that protects the rainforest from the harsh salty winds from the ocean. It also accumulates a lot of the rain wa um, water that falls and that helps preserve some of the nutrients, which is really important for the growth of plants, for the growth of rainforest. And then within the sand is fungi. And that fungi, that lichen that you can find in the sand, uh, it breaks down uh, leaves and dead trees and things like that. And it releases nutrients back into the sand, back into the soil. So over long periods of time, that sandy soil has become really nutrient rich, which helps it sustain this beautiful rainforest. So you can see some of these pictures here, so green, so full of life. Here's a picture here where you can kind of see uh, rainforest and, and the trees growing uh, right out of the sand. So part of the reason why it gets that World Heritage uh, designation is this rainforest growing uh, on the largest sand island, growing in sand. Every morning, you're greeted to this, the sun rising uh, over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you know, the water's rough, so not a lot of people do much swimming uh, here. Uh, there's also sometimes stinging jellyfish in the water. Um, a lot of tiger sharks cruise by the beach. So you don't see many people swimming. It is pretty rough water, but the sunrises every morning were just spectacular. And I mentioned the dingo. So I got up really early my first morning on the island and I was kind of walking, jogging a little bit down the beach and I noticed I was being watched. And if you look really carefully in this picture, you can see I was being watched by a dingo here. And it turned out not to be one dingo, but actually a pack, a group of about four of them. And it was such a special moment because the sun was just rising. So you can see how beautiful the light was and look at the, the fur, that beautiful ginger color uh, of the dingoes. You can see the way the light uh, is kind of hitting that fur. But if we take another little view here, here's a couple of them kind of looking back at the camera. So they were kind of my companions as I walked down the beach as they were following along as well. Not, you know, in any danger. They were curious, just like I was curious about them. So it was really neat to be able to spend this time uh, with the, ding the dingoes on Gari. And they are one of, if not the purest strain uh, of dingo in Australia. So on the mainland, dingoes kind of hybridize. They breed with dogs, right? Stray dogs, feral dogs. And so they don't, you know, over time, their coats change. They take on different characteristics on the mainland. But uh, on Gari, where they're just, uh, they're isolated from other dogs, uh, they're this kind of beautiful, kind of pure strain or colony uh, of dingoes, possibly the purest left uh, in Australia. And so there's just a picture uh, of one of their footprints in the sand. You can see those little claws uh, on their feet there in the early morning light. Now, as you make your way down 75 mile beach, you find all kinds of things to stop and see. And so this is Eli Creek. And Eli Creek is a really popular spot to stop. It's the largest creek on the eastern beach on uh, Gari, and it pours up to 4 million liters of clear fresh water into the ocean every hour. Every hour, 4 million liters of clear fresh water making its way down this creek. And so the water there is said to be some of the purest in the world. It begins in the sand dunes and can take up to 100 years to filter through the sand dunes. So by the time it comes out and flows through this um, creek, uh, you can just drink the water, you know, no worries, uh, right from the creek. It is absolutely fresh, beautiful, uh, clean water that's been filtered, uh, filtered over a hundred years. So uh, another really cool feature of the island is, is this water makes its way through through these natural springs and just comes out so beautiful, so clear. And so you can kind of see it in this picture as well, the rainforest growing right up to the edges of the creek. And you almost can't see the creek in the middle because the water is so clear. You can see every stick, every leaf, every grain of sand on the bottom of this creek, the water is so pure. So here's another shot here looking down. And again, it's hard to see, but you know, there is a creek there. 
uh, there is water. Now I mentioned there's a pretty cool shipwreck. This is a shipwreck uh, that you come across as you make your way down the beach. And this shipwreck is the Mahino. And so it was driven ashore by a cyclone. So cyclone uh, in 1935. It used to be a trans-Tasman liner. Uh, and it was bound for Japan at the time um, to the wrecking yard. I believe it was being towed uh, when the cyclone hit and it broke its tether. It broke its toe. Uh, and it beached uh, on uh, Gari, and ever since then, it's just slowly been breaking down um, over time. You know, the wood is rotting, the salt is corroding and rusting the metal. I think I have a couple more pictures here from kind of a different angle here. So uh, a neat kind of landmark uh, that you find on the beach. And a little bit further down, you find this formation here. And this formation is pretty well known. This formation goes by a few names, the colored sands, the pinnacles, sometimes it's called the cathedral. Um, and so you see all these different colors. It's hard to tell, but there's, they say there's up to 75 different colors of oranges and reds and whites and browns. And this all kind of represents almost a history, a timepiece uh, of Gari and how the sand was laid down at different times. Uh, how it was exposed to the weather and things like that um, have led to these different layers and this different coloration. So it's almost like a timepiece representing different events that took place on the island. And of course, there's a legend behind it as well uh, from the Aboriginal people. So their legend is that these sands were formed when the rainbow serpent uh, of the Pachala people uh, died for its lover, protecting her from a jealous husband. Upon his death, he fell to the earth and shattered into many colored pieces, creating what became known today uh, as the pinnacles. So really kind of tall. We can't really tell from this picture, but as you walk closer, you can see why it's sometimes nicknamed the cathedral because you feel like you're surrounded um, by this formation and, and this timepiece uh, documenting uh, how Gari has changed over time. And then, I mean, Anytime you look around, you see these incredible views. So this, I guess this would be as close as you get to a parking lot uh, on the island. You can see the four by four is kind of parked here. Uh, beautiful view out over the ocean, all the sand, of course, and the shrubs and trees growing from it. And this kind of walking up here is Indian Head. So Indian Head is one of those three really important rock formations that anchored the sand over hundreds of thousands of years uh, and created this sand, sand island in the first place. So kind of another view again, looking out over the sand uh, in another direction. And then kind of a, a view of Indian Head as well. You can see a large rock formation. I'm kind of sitting on the edge of it. And people like to come here and look down into the water because if you're here long enough, you can see all kinds of things passing by. Um, whales, uh, tiger sharks, manta rays, um, fish. You know, if you're patient and you watch, it's like a highway of marine life that makes its way past this point that sticks out into the water. And I know this doesn't look like much, but this dark blob, this dark spot here was a manta ray, uh, slowly making its way past uh, the island, slowly flapping its big wings uh, and just gliding beautifully through the water. It doesn't look like much here, but I, I assure you that dark spot was... Uh, something beautiful under the water, and then just kind of another view uh, out over the water there. Now, invasive species. So that's kind of a story that's been um, a similar story in both of the other islands that, that we've looked at as well, Christmas Island as well as Norfolk. And it's that islands are amazing places. You can find many endemic species, so species found nowhere else in the world on these islands. But when an invasive species is brought to the island. Sometimes it happens naturally, but many times uh, it is through human activity. When an invasive species makes its way to the island, it can decimate the local flora and fauna, the local plants and animals, because they're not used to them as predators or they compete with them for resources or habitat and space. So all kinds of different things. So this is one example here. This is a cane toad. So you can see it's a very big cane toad next to the size of my hand. 
cane tones that many of you may know already were introduced to Australia to control uh, cane beetles, so beetles that were eating sugar cane. Unfortunately, the cane toads decided, you know what? We really like all these other things to eat, like small snakes and small reptiles and lizards and other amphibians and frogs and toads. So they've been breeding like crazy and spreading across Australia and have made their way uh, to Fraser Island. And they don't have any natural predators. These massive, massive glands here, you can see these two bumps are full of venom. So if a snake or a bird eats this cane toad, it could get very sick and likely potentially even die from the amount of venom uh, in uh, these sacs here these um, that the cane toads have. And so just a few other examples uh, of invasive species. There's uh, different weeds and plants. So a few examples are the Singapore daisy, uh, the asparagus fern, uh, the bitu bush. There's pests like leafhoppers, so insects that have made their way to the island. And there's also larger feral animals like the cane toad, like cats, horses, and fire ants uh, that have been introduced to the island. So, you know, some of the larger animals are easier to try to control, but things like toads, things like insects, things like plants, those take massive conservation projects uh, to try and eliminate um, those species from the island. This is how you stay. You have your tents packed in the back of your four by four and you kind of move away from the beach because the high tide usually comes in. You can't drive on it uh, at certain times of the day anyways. And you kind of set up uh, your tents at different spots uh, to spend the night. And sometimes vehicles break down, unfortunately. Uh, that happened to us, our radiator hose uh, went. And so luckily there were some rangers who were able to help us out uh, with a new piece of hose and, we, and eventually we were able to get back uh, out onto the sand tracks, out onto the sandy roads uh, and continue exploring. But these four by fours take a real beating uh, time and time again, uh, driving through these islands. Some of the wildlife, uh, here's a guana. I just, I love the wildlife. You can see all kinds of great adaptations and features here. This tail is a great self-defense mechanism. It's like a whip. If you get too close, uh, this guana can hit you with its tail. You can see it's got these great claws for digging, right? Looking for food, digging for nests and things like that. And so if we get in a little bit closer here, you can get a, a look here at these big, powerful claws uh, right down here, which are really important for finding uh, insects and eggs and things like that. Things that may be burrowed down, uh, looking for tasty things to eat. Sometimes you sit down on a picnic bench and you don't realize you have company. So this is a carpet python uh, and just a beautiful, beautiful coloration, beautiful snake. Um, not venomous, so you don't have to worry about that. They're constrictors, so they catch their prey and they wrap them up in their coils and slowly suffocate them uh, before they swallow them. And they've just got amazing adaptations all along here. You can kind of see these little pits. Uh, and they detect, they can detect heat. So at night, they can hunt for small mammals and follow their heat. Of course, use their tongue for scents in the air. So they have amazing adaptations for hunting their prey. Again, the beautiful sun uh, rises every morning. The rough waves, of course, they're there, but those sunrises are just, you know, something to behold. Here's an example of why you don't want to be stuck out at high tide. So we're not driving, I'm walking here, but you can see the high tides coming in and the beach, it's going to come right up to here. Uh, there's nowhere to drive. You can't drive those four by fours in the water, obviously. Uh, so at different times of the day, you have to be careful and make sure, you know, you plan out where you're going to be because you're going to be stuck there uh, once that high tide comes in. Um, again, just some views of the forest, the rainforest growing uh, from the sand. And then the last thing that I want to share with you is another one of these beautiful perched lakes. This is uh, Lake Wabi, and this is a special lake for several different reasons. One, it's the deepest lake, the deepest perch lake uh, on Fraser Island. I believe it's something in the neighborhood of 11 meters deep. Um, another reason why it's special is it's going to be gone in as little as a hundred years. Uh, 
this massive kind of wall of sand is slowly moving, uh, I think at about a rate of a meter a year. And eventually it is going to swallow this whole lake up and it's going to disappear. Now, a few other interesting things about this lake is that it's not very acidic. So there's tons of different fish species that live in this lake. So it's not a huge lake, but there's it, it's got some of the most biodiversity of any of the, the lakes. There's about 100 freshwater lakes on Gari. And this is one of the most biodiverse here because it's not very acidic. Um, and it's also was an area of high significance uh, to the Bachilla people. So it was a men's only area. So ceremonies took place on the sand dunes. This happened for thousands of years. Boys were brought to this lake in particular, and then they left as men. So it was a real important place for ceremony uh, for thousands of years. And yeah, in about 100 years or so, it could be gone forever, swallowed up by the sand. Um, and so let's take a little closer look here at the coloration. It's beautiful green water, so very different from Lake Mackenzie, which was very clear, pure water, uh, whereas this is kind of, you know, more plant matter in it, uh, more organic matter, uh, which is great for all the life uh, that can be found living within these green waters. Okay, well, I think that's kind of what I want to share with you today, kind of a whirlwind tour of what makes this island so unique what earns it this amazing world heritage uh, status from being the world's largest sand island to the rainforest and the sand dunes to the beautiful uh, perched lakes. Um, most of them in the world found on this island. It has a rich Aboriginal history. And so last year was a, it was a big deal when the, uh, you know, the traditional name, the island was given back to the people. The traditional name of Gari was returned uh, to the island last year, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and I know is a hugely significant, uh, a huge significance to, to the local Aboriginal peoples. So I would love to turn it over now to some of your questions. I might even have a few pictures that I can share uh, to tackle some of the questions that you might have. I can already see some of them coming into the chat. So let me take the screen share down for now and let's switch gears. So Continue saying hi in the chat, continue putting in your questions, and we'll spend the rest of the time uh, just talking a little bit more about uh, the island. So I see someone here from Forest View Academy saying they're on the coast, so they're near Gari, which is very cool. Um, I can see some other more people saying hi here in the chat. Uh, let's jump uh, on to some more questions. So a question about that wreck on the beach, that's a great question. Uh, were there any explorers wrecked during that one, the Mahino? No, there weren't any, um, uh, I don't believe there are any people on board because the ship was being towed. You know, the ship had been in service um, for a long period of time and it was actually on its way to Japan to be scrapped, to be wrecked. Uh, so I believe it was being towed when the cyclone hit, the tow was broken uh, and it washed ashore uh, onto the beach. Now there is a history of wrecks um, on the island. And the, in fact, the original name Fraser Island came from uh, a wreck that did take place there. And there was a woman, a Scottish woman who whose life was actually saved by the Aboriginal people. Um, she was only on the island for a short period of time. And that's kind of where the name for the island came from. Now, there's some controversy because when she returned, she said she was poorly treated uh, by the Aboriginal people on uh, the island, but there isn't really a lot of evidence for that uh, having taken place. But it did lead to um, people on the island being killed and displaced from the island. So a lot of controversy behind the name of the island, that event in history. So it is really great to see the island being returned, the name being restored, uh, Gari to the island. Uh, okay, any ants on the island? Absolutely. So we've uh, ants have actually come up a few times. I think we talked about crazy ants, uh, yellow crazy ants on Christmas Island uh, being an issue. They can also be found in the Seychelles. And then we talked about fire ants uh, on Norfolk, and you can find fire ants, uh, invasive fire ants uh, on the island uh, here as well. And you might think, well, you know, what, what, what kind of harm can ants do? Well, there, there's several things. 
One being that large group of ants can attack things like young baby birds, um, you know, small amphibians uh, and other creatures that are native to the island, insects and things like that. Um, they can also, you know, be a, a, a burden to humans as well who are on the island. Now, there's lots of tourism on the island. I think it's something around 180 people live on the island. So there's not a lot of people who live on the island. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of tourists who visit uh, the island. So you have another question here about when Fraser Island was found. So we know Aboriginal people were living on Fraser Island for at least 5,000 years. It could be as long as 50,000 years, but we know 5,000 years for sure. And I believe it was around the 1700s when um, uh, uh, Gari was was discovered, we'll say, by by um, European uh, visitors. But it was inhabited, you know, for at least 5,000 years, maybe uh, as long as 50,000 years. It's not very far from the mainland. You can see uh, the shore. The ferry ride across is only a few minutes long. Uh, sometimes you almost feel like you could walk across when the, the low tide goes out. It doesn't look like it's that deep or that far. Uh, okay. What was my favorite part? Alana wants to know what was my favorite part. Um... Wow, that's hard. I, 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 I always go back to that morning with the dingoes. Um, you know, they're, it's, they're just beautiful, beautiful animals. Their color, that, that ginger, that red color, especially when the sun hits them first thing in the morning, is just amazing. Um, and there's kind of, you know, tourism can be really good in some senses in that it provides, uh, you know, an an economic benefit to people in the area. It helps protect an area, right? Because if people are visiting it, um, you know, effort is put to conserve it and protect it. But the dingoes, you know, like any other dog, you know, canine, they're very attracted to people, the smells, right? People bring food with them when they're camping. So they're very attracted to people. They hang around the campsite sometimes. And that can always lead to, to confrontations. And unfortunately, that can lead to, to bad consequences for the dingoes, whether they become too familiar or habituated with people. Um, or, you know, if an incident happens where a dingo, they call it a problem one because it bit someone, um, you know, it can be moved uh, or even have to be put down. So amazing to see this beautiful, pure population there. Um, but, um, you really have to be careful and, you know, give them space, protect your food. Uh, don't give them reasons to come too close to people. Cause that's when conflict, you know, uh, human carnivore conflict can happen. Um, Ali, oops, can you, you sent me a question here. You're wondering about, oh, why don't they remove the ship? Um, I think a couple of reasons. I think one being uh, it would be hard to do when it's already up on the shore like that. I think um, because it, it wasn't bothering anybody, it wasn't, you know, a priority. And now it's really just become an attraction uh, on the island. It's not really doing any harm. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's kind of become a part of the history of the island, a story, a, a legend. So I think at the Nobody really cared because I don't think the island was that big of a tourist destination yet. Um, it would have been really hard to get it back off the sand beach and possibly the boat doing it could have got beached as well. And then I think now it's just a popular tourist um, uh, tourist operation. Yeah, so they just leave it there. It's kind of a landmark on the beach. Um, let's see. Are the frogs poisonous to human? Yeah, absolutely. The the venom in in the cane toads, uh, you know, anything that eats it would would be affected by it. Now humans are bigger, so you know maybe it would make us feel kind of sick for an afternoon, maybe a few days. I don't know if if it would kill us, but we definitely wouldn't feel great. And what's kind of interesting is some birds are actually starting to figure out a way to eat the cane toads, which is which is a really interesting um, 
thing that they've learned to do is to catch when they catch a cane toad, instead of eating the whole cane toad, they turn it upside down. So it's laying on its back. And then if it's on its back, um, it, uh, they can kind of eat underneath and leave the poison glands alone. So, uh, yeah, kind of really interesting the way the birds are, are, are kind of figuring out, uh, how to get in there today. Uh, I see a few people asking if we're going to have a Kahoot today. We're not going to have a Kahoot today um, because I can see our time is already kind of running long. So I want to make sure that we get some more of those questions in. But I promise we will have a Kahoot uh, during the next two. The next two is Lord Howe Island and then Kangaroo Island. So I usually make the Kahoot behind the scenes while the speaker is presenting. So since I was the one presenting today, I couldn't really make it behind the scenes today. But uh, we will have the Kahoot for the next uh, two events, I promise. Uh, okay, a few more questions here. Really good question about snakes on the island. So I'm actually going to have to check that because um, we didn't see any snakes when we visited Gari. Um, and so we were there a few times. So let's see if there's any snakes. We're going to do a handy... Actually, that, that is a little bit of a lie. I did see one type of snake. I'll tell you about it in a second. So we know there's the pythons right? We saw that picture. They're not venomous. There is a very venomous species of snake that can be found on, on the island. Actually, in the water around the island are olive-headed sea snakes. So sea snakes are awesome. They're snakes that live in the ocean. So they breathe air. They hunt down on the ocean floor, looking around rocks, looking around coral reef for things to eat. And they are very, very venomous. So their tails look a little bit different than a regular snake. They're kind of squished flat. Uh, and that helps them move through the water. They come on uh, to shore sometimes, especially if they're going to lay some eggs. So we did actually see one that had washed up on the shore, one of the olive-headed sea snakes. And they are incredibly venomous. Very venomous snakes. But the only way one would ever bite you is if you were grabbing it in the water. If you were swimming in the water, the snake doesn't want anything to do with you. It's gonna swim the other way. Um, if it swims by you, it's gonna ignore you. The only reason you'd ever, ever be bit by one of these sea snakes is if you grabbed it uh, in the water. And then of course, like anything else, if it's scared, it's gonna defend itself, right? Um, it doesn't know what you're up to. So there are some pythons and, and they're non-venomous. There's a snake called the rough scaled snake you can find on the island as well. And then I forgot all about the sea snakes. And we did see one of those olive headed sea snakes uh, that came onto the shore uh, from the ocean. So there are some snakes. I see another question, a great question here about the birds on uh, Fraser Island or uh, Gari. And we definitely saw some of those. We saw little birds called um, flycatchers who kind of sit in the trees and zip around and catch flies out of the air. Uh, there's shorebirds that wade along the shore and look for things to eat uh, out of the sand. There's seabirds that visit, like white-bellied storm petrel um, that visit the island. Shearwaters are another species that visit the island. And then there's beautiful um, uh, hawks, like uh, fishing eagles that visit the island. And we saw some of those, not very close. They were kind of high in the sky, just kind of gliding along the beach, looking for maybe some fish uh, or something like that to dive down on. So there's definitely, definitely birds uh, found on Gari for sure. Good question. Um, okay, let's see. Did the ship that was towing get wrecked as well? I don't believe it did. I think... It, because there were people on board, um, because uh, it had a, a motor, uh, I don't believe that the other ship was wrecked. But we can take a quick look here on Google just to make sure. Um, let's see if it says anything here. Uh, Here we go. So the ships were linked by 900 foot wire rope. So this happened in July. It was 50 miles from the coast. So it was actually, you know, pretty far away from the island. 50, 50 miles an island is pretty far. It broke uh, from, 
uh, the um, the the line. They tried to reattach it a few times, but they weren't able to because the ships, uh, the water was really rough. And it actually does say that there was a skeleton crew on board of eight people uh, who drifted away and disappeared. So it actually does look like there was a small crew on board uh, and they must have lost their life during um, during that storm. But as far as I can tell, the towing ship, it looks like the towing ship was okay. Um, and so let's see a little bit more here. Yeah, there's no plans to remove it. It's protected by the Commonwealth Historic Shipwrecks Act of 1976. So there's no plans to remove it. And actually, I want to share this picture with you. This is a really cool picture. Um, I'm, I'm going to share this my screen here and share this really interesting picture here with you. Um, let me pick a Chrome tab. Let's make sure I pick the right one. Yeah. So here's a kind of a black and white picture of what it looked like uh, early on uh, when it did come up ashore. So you can see it was kind of like a, a cruising liner. Um, you can see a couple smokestacks there and you can see it came right up onto the beach here. And then of course, if you look at some of these other pictures over here, here's a picture, it looks, looks like a painting of it when it was still in service. And then you can see what it looks like now. You can see it's broken down a lot uh, over time. So you can see the difference. You can see this is low tide. So it's right out of the water and you can see high tide. It's kind of partially submerged again. Very cool. Uh, okay, let's see. Reptiles. Well, we talked a little bit about the reptiles. We talked about some of the snakes. You saw that guana. So there's there's uh, lizards on the island. You saw uh, those freshwater turtles, right? There would be sea turtles that probably come up and use the, the beach uh, to lay their eggs at different times. Um, yeah, so very cool. There's definitely reptiles to be found uh, on the island. So let's jump into a few more questions here. So Luna's wondering about the different species of fish. Well, we know depending on the lake um, that sometimes there could be not very many in a lake or sometimes there could be a lot. So um, on Fraser Island, uh, there's lots of fish that can be found. Of course, you can find lots of fish uh in the in the ocean waters around and then you can find fish in the lakes and the creeks so lake wabi which we looked at before has 12 species of fish uh found within that lake 12 different species of fish so that's kind of what they're saying there is there's about 12 species of freshwater fish uh that can be found uh on the island all right, let's see if we have any more questions before we wrap up for tonight. Maya wants to know if there's types of crabs there. Great question, Maya, and absolutely. Anytime you're around the ocean, um, you will find crabs. And I didn't put a picture in, but there's hermit crabs that come right up on the beach and in fact, right into the campsites. And they're really, really small, the ones that we saw. Kind of a pale um, color. Uh, with a little shell that they carry. Um, so absolutely, uh, anywhere that, you, that you're on shore, you can generally find um, crabs near the ocean. And so there's a few other different kinds. There's a really cool species called a ghost crab. Um, and what's kind of neat about them is that most crabs kind of scoot along sideways a little bit, but the ghost crabs uh, are able to walk forwards quite well, which is kind of unique. There's sand bubbler crabs, and then there's orange clawed fiddler crabs. So those are a few crab species uh, that you can find on Fraser Island, including those really tiny ones that I told you about. Um, in fact, let me see, because we have a minute, let me see if I can grab, if I have, uh, whoops, if I have a, a picture handy. Oh, no, I won't. I unplugged my, my, um, uh, my hard drive, so I don't have a, a picture handy. But yeah, definitely lots of different crab species. Uh, in Lake Mackenzie, other than those turtles, so those freshwater turtles, I didn't see anything else. I didn't see any fish while I was snorkeling. Um, I didn't see very many insects, but lots of those turtles. 
when I went down to the bottom and looked out, I probably saw 20 or 30 of their heads poking kind of out of the muddy leafy bits at the bottom. And I uh, bet that it just would keep continuing uh, those turtles. And so I bet they eat things like insects in the water. I bet they eat some of the maybe plant material uh, when they're in the water. Okay. The dingoes, what are the dingoes eating? Dingoes will be eating small mammals. Um, those are things that they'd like to eat. I think dingoes will eat things like amphibians uh, and reptiles as well if they can catch them. So dingoes, dingoes aren't really picky. Um, you know, they, they hunt in their packs, in their groups, uh, and they'll catch little mammals on the island uh, and some of the reptiles as well. How deep are the lakes? So not very deep. Lake Mackenzie was maybe 20, 25 feet deep. And Lake Wabi is about 11 meters, which is about 30 to 33 feet deep. So that was probably the deepest lake, um, or that's the deepest freshwater lake of the uh, about 100 or so freshwater lakes. Uh, any types of turtles, other types of turtles. So sea turtles, like green sea turtles, um, maybe hawksbill turtles, green sea turtles for sure would probably come ashore. Um, and then just those freshwater turtles. Um, I saw those freshwater turtles. I saw them in Lake Wabi and I saw them uh, in Lake Mackenzie as well. Yeah. So Gari is an amazing island. I hope you all get a chance to visit it. I know one group said that they live pretty close to it. Uh, so I hope you do get a chance uh, to visit Gari. It is just an amazing island. It's a unique island um, with features found on you know, different from any other islands in the world. Um, of course, it's the world's largest. It's got the rainforest. It's got those perch lakes. Um, yeah, it's uh, just a, a, a beautiful place. It's a well-protected place, which is really important. Uh, and it's a really neat experience to drive around the island uh, and have planes land in front of you on the beach kind of neat. So all kinds of things to see. So one final question here. Uh, can any animals on the island eat the cane, the cane toad? Um, that's a good question. I don't think many could. I, I know if a snake uh, were to eat them, they can be poisoned. I know that birds can be as well. I know a dingo probably wouldn't feel too good after eating one. Um, I just did a quick search here. There is a snake called the keelback snake in Australia. It's non-venomous and it's in Northern Australia. So it wouldn't be found on Gari, but apparently they can eat cane toes without um, a lethal effect. Whereas many other snake species um, wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, let me double check the dingoes. I don't think dingoes would. I think they'd be in trouble, just like any other mammal. But let's just double check. Yeah, what they... Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look like cane toe or the dingo would, would do very well. And so um, they're best to stay away from it. So that one species of snake in Australia sounds like for whatever reason, uh, it's able to um, deal with or neutralize that venom from the cane toads. And we talked about those birds, how those birds flip um, the cane toads over. And so I have a, one more question here. We're getting some good invasive species questions coming in here. Um, so wondering where the cane toads came from in the first place. So their scientific name is Bufo Marianus, uh, and they're a neotropical toad or marine toad. So uh, found on land in Central and South America. So they would have been brought over from Central to South America. And I think it's an important lesson is that ecosystems are beautifully balanced on their own. And when we start changing them, um, the results aren't good. And when we try to make changes to fix the changes we made, sometimes we make mistakes 
And I think cane toads are a very um, significant example of something brought in to control the cane beetles, but we couldn't, you know, I, I guess nobody realized how quickly they'd reproduce and that instead of eating the cane toads like they hoped they would, um, they started to really eat and affect native uh, wildlife in Australia. And they're spreading quickly into the northern, through the Northern Territories, uh, into the Kimberley. I know they're spreading further south. I'm trying to think the furthest south I saw them. Um, definitely on Gari. Definitely saw lots of them in Queensland. Uh, up like the Daintree Rainforest, saw lots of them there. Um, I don't know that I saw many in New South Wales. But uh, they definitely have reached New South Wales, but I didn't see them down where we lived in Wollongong. Maybe I didn't look hard enough, um, but I didn't see them down in that area. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining today. I um, really appreciate uh, seeing familiar groups, seeing new groups joining these, these lessons. I'm excited for later in the week. So on the 19th, uh, same time, 1 p.m. AEST or Sydney time, we are going to meet Ian and we're going to talk about Lord Howe Island. Lord Howe Island is just a beautiful island far flung from the shores of Australia. Uh, and I think you're really going to enjoy meeting Ian. He has been uh, living on the island as a tour guide, running a museum there for decades. So he is the perfect person uh, to introduce us to Lord Howe Island. We'll have a Kahoot hot and ready to go uh, as well from Ian's presentation. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. I will share those links one more time to the Roots and Shoots page. Do sign up there, get some more information, and of course, join the Facebook community. Uh, lots of updates uh, and ways that you can kind of take action and join in uh, with what's happening. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, thank you for all the great messages I'm seeing in the chat. And I look forward to seeing everybody uh, on the 19th. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. And we'll see you later.